if we would take our Bibles this morning, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We want to continue our series of messages today dealing with religious myths. Religious myths. These are things that religious people repeat often, usually well-intentioned, but not well thought out, and often very seriously flawed. So as you're turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we've already considered a few myths. We've considered the myth, just read your Bible. Just go to church. And then the third part of the series was just pray this prayer. And today on part four, we're considering the religious myth, just sow your seed. Just sow your seed. Here are some of the messages that we hear often in the church today, especially by those in televangelism. And I'm quoting them right off of their websites. If you need a financial miracle today, everything you need is hidden in your seed. Your seed has the power to produce an abundant harvest. Sow in faith today and expect your miracle, for everything you need is in your seed. The bigger the seed, the bigger the miracle. With your seed, you'll tap into God's supernatural power. In fact, I want to read you just a few paragraphs from a letter that one of the largest television ministries in the charismatic movement has on their website. This is what it said. God places such an importance on sowing and reaping, and he has given me a special word about it in 2013. He has told me to share with his people that he wants to deliver them from debt so that they can have the freedom to move into his purpose and destiny for their lives. These are, there are special seasons of anointing for prosperity and debt reduction. This is one of them. That is why we are dedicating December 31st as a special supernatural debt reduction day of prayer. If you want to be part of this extraordinary season, trigger the process in your own life by releasing your faith through sowing a sacrificial seed toward the gospel and giving that seed an assignment for your miracle. Be part of this unusual harvest season. What can you give today as a seed? $1,000? $500? $250? Whatever it is, assign your seed. Then believe for a major miracle in your life. Imagine having all of your needs met as you continue to move through 2013. Unquote. So this part of confessing Christianity, which is very public, televised, very well known, the message is give your money... And everything will be better in life. Miracles will happen. Tap into God's power. Get out of debt. Money equals amazing things when given to these ministries. Now there's a problem with this. Here is the problem. Jesus himself gave a parable about seed and the sowing of seed. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 and 25, it says he put another parable before them. And he said this, The kingdom of heaven can be compared to a man who sows good seed in the field. Good seed is thrown out into the field. He's explaining the role of God, the spreading of the gospel, and he's comparing it to sowing your seed. Verse 25, While this man's men were sleeping, the enemy came and he sowed weeds, bad seeds that produce weeds among the wheat, and then the enemy went away. In other words, weeds or bad seeds were sowed among the good seeds. Now, the concept of sowing your seed is in the Bible. There's no doubt about that. It is talked about, and we are going to understand it today. But I believe this teaching that if you give your money, God will bless you, is weeds sown among the good seed. It is really a message that the enemy has used to confuse Christians about the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible does talk about sowing your seed, but it's never to get it from God. It is not to use or manipulate God. It is not for your luxury. 
Almost every passage of the New Testament, except for one, that speaks of a seed refers not to money at all, not to finances at all, but instead to the very words of our God. There is a passage in which one man tried to purchase the gift of God by sowing a financial seed. And it did not end well. His name was Simon. In Acts chapter 8, Peter said to Simon, listen to this message. This is a message for many in the modern church today. May your silver perish with you. Because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter. For your heart is not right with God. What is the issue? The money? The issue is your heart. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your thought of your heart may be forgiven you. My friends, the only passage in the New Testament that speaks of sowing a seed in reference to money, to financial giving, is found in the book of 2 Corinthians, where you are right now. In chapter 8 of this book, Paul showed the example of the Macedonian Christians and the way Jesus gave as an example for us and how we should give. And then in chapter 9, Paul begins to tell about the financial need that was with the Christians in Jerusalem. There was many very poor believers in the city of Jerusalem. Because, you see, when people surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ, it cost them much in the first century. And by the way, it still should cost us much today. We should die to self daily as we live closer with Christ. Paul was coming to the city of Corinth soon, but before he came, he wanted them to take a collection for the poor at Jerusalem, as the Corinthians had done before. They had been generous before in their giving. And here's the thing. He wanted the whole business of the collection completed before he arrived, so there would be nothing even remotely questionable about his visit concerning receiving this offering. He wanted no mixture of ministry and preaching and the giving of money. He did not want his intentions to be questioned as much of the world does today when they watch religious television programming and all they hear is the modern prosperity theology. Ironically, in chapters 10 through 13, Paul tells the Corinthian church to confront the false apostles of the church head on, which is essentially what we are doing today. This passage gives God's principles the proper teaching for sowing your seed financially. And it should be followed in the acceptable manner that it teaches by giving by love, not giving to get. It is of great importance to us today that we not only give, that we not only sow our seed, but the way we give. Because God is much more concerned, not about money, but about the condition of our hearts. So if you'll look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, let's read verses 6 and 7, and then we will pray and ask for God's help to clear our minds as to what the Holy Spirit wants to teach us from His Word. Scripture says, Paul is speaking, this I say, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly, not of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. For as it is written, now he quotes the Old Testament, the righteous man has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower, that's God, and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. While you are enriched in everything with all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. For the administration of this service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. Would you join me in prayer, please? Our Father, we need clarity today. There is much confusion about the sowing of seed. 
And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would work by the power of your Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who gave us this word, to also teach us this word today. Impress deep in our hearts the importance of sowing seed, the importance of giving, but also the proper means of doing this so that you would be glorified, so that needs of the saints and the poor would be met, so our lights would shine, not for our self-satisfaction, but that so men would bring glory unto your name. And we will give you praise as we worship you by studying your word. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. In verse 6, Paul begins with a principle drawn from nature. He says, this is what I say to you. I want to prevent you from giving an offering only out of your excess, only out of your abundance. I don't want you to be stingy or only give very sparingly. I want you to understand the power that is involved when you give to God with a heart of worship. Whenever I think about giving and a heart of worship and giving generously, I'm reminded of a story about a well-worn $1 bill and a distressed $100 bill that arrived at the Federal Reserve Bank at the same time. And they were both to be retired on the same day. And as they moved along the conveyor belt to be burned, these two bills struck up a conversation. The $100 bill reminisced about its travels all over the world. It said, I've had a pretty good life. I have been to Las Vegas. I've been to Atlantic City. I've been to Broadway. I've been to the best restaurants in New York. I've even been to the Caribbean on a cruise. Wow, explained the $1 bill. You've really had an exciting life. So tell me, says the $100 bill to the $1 bill, where have you been in your lifetime? The $1 bill replied, oh, I've had many experiences. I've been to the Methodist church, the Baptist church, and even the Lutheran church. In which the $100 bill responded, please tell me, what is a church? Thank you. We often give... Not generously, but sparingly. Only out of our excess, not out of our provision. I want you to understand there are real needs in Jerusalem, as Paul speaks. People in Jerusalem are in need of help. You look around our city today, there are real needs. I read you that letter from a family that our church was blessed to be able to help. They were devastated. They had nothing. There are people that are struggling everywhere in this world. I was just in a country that is very civilized, but also has many places that are very much third world, in which people live in extreme poverty, in which I was told not to take out a bill, 50,000 pesos, which would be equal to about 25 American dollars. I was told, do not take that bill out in public in this little town that I walk to because this would be too much money to show to the people in the, in the area. It would be offensive and you would be a target. See, there are many people that are poor and hurting. And in Jerusalem, this was the case. And it is the church's job not to ignore them, but instead to serve them, especially those of the household of faith, especially those who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible says, If anyone has the world's goods, we are blessed financially. And we see a brother in need. And yet we close our heart against them. How does God's love abide in you? In other words, you don't reflect the heart of God. You don't reflect the spirit of God. You have a closed, hard heart. As Ezekiel the prophet says, you have not been given a new heart. Your heart is still hard, a heart of flesh that is not alive. Now Paul here is talking by observation. He's talking by experience to the Corinthian church. In the first century, it was very common to understand this agricultural principle of sowing and reaping. It would be very close to their hearts. And he says this is so true in the natural world just as it is in the spiritual world. You will only reap or you only get fruit. You only harvest in proportion to that in which you sow. So if a man sows very few seeds in the ground, he will expect very little fruit to reap. If you sow a very small piece of land, you will reap a very small harvest of fruit. If you are stingy in your sowing and you wish to save your seed and you will not commit it to the ground, you must expect to get very little at the end of the harvest season. 
Many Christians are like this today. We try to hold on to as much seed as we can. Many churches are like this. They are close-fisted. They have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank, and yet they can't find any money to support any missionaries. They cannot find any money to help the poor and the needy and the hurting in their community. If someone is close-fisted like this, we will have much seed left over in our barn after the harvest is over. But let me ask you something. What is better, to have much fruit to show or to have a lot of seeds in the barn at the end of the season? What will do more for your life? What will do more for your family? What will do more for your neighbors, to have a bunch of seeds or have much fruit to share with others? Coming back from Colombia this week, I had 20,000 pesos in my wallet. If only the numbers were equivalent with a modern American dollars. That is 10 American dollars, by the way. And I had a choice. Save the bill, which could be of no use to me in the United States, or I could go ahead in the airport, literally minutes before I left the country, and buy a bag of coffee, which is about all I could get with that money in the airport, because they inflate their prices in the airport, just like American airports. And so I could come back to the USA, save my seed, and have a worthless piece of paper. Instead, I decided to come back with a bag of coffee that I will enjoy for weeks to come. You see, do you hold on to what you have, or do you use it to get fruit? So here's the question. How and why do people sow sparingly? A farmer sowing seed might feel like this. He is losing his seed as it falls to the ground. He doesn't have control of it anymore. No more can he fall back on the seed. We may many times feel we are losing. It's like a bad investment when we give. He might feel like it is as good as if it is lost. Many people, when they help someone who is poor, impoverished, homeless, they say, well, the only reason why they're in that condition is they don't know how to handle money. And so if I give it to them, I might as well kiss that money goodbye. It was a bad investment. It will never be used. And it's the same way with the farmer. When you put your seed in the ground, there's no indication of a return or an increase right away. I love to watch kids plant seeds. I know we've done this experiment before. And they come back the next morning after they plant the seed expecting to see a tree, right? And what do they see? Nothing. It looks the same. It looks the same for like... Three weeks, and then all of a sudden they see a little green sprout. If they've been patient enough to wait that long. Oftentimes they throw the pot out in frustration before they even get to see the green come up. One who does not understand how farming works, how God and His divine providence has made the earth to work, would consider his sowing of seeds worthless if he looked for fruit right away. And so he would consider his work and his sowing lost. So he gives very close-fisted, just a little bit, just enough to give the appearance that he's a farmer. Always afraid that he won't have any seed left. Always worrying about the future. He worries that some of the seed will fall off onto the beaten path. Some will fall on rocky soil. Some will fall into a briar patch. He worries about the weather conditions. He worries about insects destroying much of the seed as if God cannot handle all these things or that none of the seed will fall on good soil. He's always worried about the future and he considers it his job to give the seed life and growth. Well, what did Jesus say about all this? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, If God can clothe the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow it's thrown into an oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? By the way, he's rebuking us. You of little faith. He says, do not be anxious saying, what will we eat tomorrow? What will we drink tomorrow? What will we wear tomorrow? Do not be anxious about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be anxious for itself. You just need to worry about the needs of today. The farmer that is very sparing in his sowing forgets the season of harvest is going to come, how good the fruit will be when it's gathered. He is faithless. So with money given to God's work. 
Too many people see offerings, sowing the financial seed, as a waste, as throwing away money. Many people complain the church does not handle their money wisely. And that is a sin if the church does not handle money wisely. It is a grievous sin to God, and God will hold the church accountable. But, my friends, I tell you today, God is not concerned about anything but the condition of the heart of the one that sows the seed. He will handle the seed. That's His job. Our job is how we sow it. It's very important to note this. Many of us in our lives have a very pathetic harvest in our lives year after year. And this is because we sow our seed without faith. We don't believe that God can do great things. We believe that this is nothing more than a ritual, a routine that we're going through. And so we make sure we bang our pennies hard into the plate when the plate is passed by so people hear and think something great has happened. Many sow seeds also thinking it will make God love them more. This is my problem with the prosperity theology. My friends, nothing can make God love you more. Many people sow seeds thinking it is a way of improving their standing before God, thinking you earn His special favor and you'll have a miraculous breakthrough, earning His love, improving your standing with God if you just give more. My friends, that is called legalism. God is not impressed with what you give. He is impressed with, with what Jesus gave in your place. This turns sowing into a burden instead of a blessing, and it is an actual seed. Whenever you add an adjective to the word gospel, such as the prosperity gospel, meaning you can get from God if you give, it is really another gospel. It is a false gospel because God does not bless you based on who you are. He blesses based on what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. And to say He only blesses you based on who you are makes very little of the cross of Jesus Christ. Eliphaz, speaking to Job in chapter 4, verse 8, said these words, As I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. And I want to say to you today, there's many people very sincere who sow their seed into ministries because they are promised on TV. God has told me, if you do this, you'll have a tenfold blessing. He'll remove your debt. And many promises like this are given, not knowing the will of God for this person. Scripture says, who has known the mind of God and who has been his counselor? Who has first given to God that God should repay him? Who are you, O oh man, to tell the potter what to do? This is a total rebuke of the sovereignty of God. The God has spoken us into existence. We are going to command Him to do something because we give Him money. He does not need our money. He made the trees that the money came from. Think about this. In contrast to this type of a farmer who sows sparingly, who is close-fisted, we read about another who sows bountifully and so in turn reaps bountifully. A good farmer sows his seed with an open hand. He sows widely. He sows in faith, knowing that some of the seed may fall on bad ground, but some will fall on good ground. Not with a closed fist, but instead in anticipation that the sovereign God, who provided naturally seeds in the fruit, will also provide new life in His time. Again, at first it might look like a loss. The first few weeks it might look like nothing's going to happen. Some of the plants might die after they've only grown a little bit. But you have to remember something, the principle of nature. When the seed gets into the ground, it begins to decay when it germinates. But in due time, it will spring up. In due time, you will have fruit and a good harvest. Proverbs 11.24 says, When one gives freely... He grows all the richer. When another withholds what he should give, he only suffers in want. You see, friends, sowing seed in Scripture does not mean funding multi-million dollar mansions, television programs, Armani suits, six-figure cars, private jets, or fancy buildings. These things are foreign to the New Testament and the heart of God. Why should some televangelists live that way, and yet Jesus had nowhere to lay his head? There is nothing wrong with being blessed of God financially. We will talk about this. God does bless some very much financially. 
And yet that is not a sign of spirituality. Just as being poor is not a sign of spirituality. These are not the things that make a person close to Christ. It is the condition of their heart that makes them close to Jesus Christ. You say, prove that, Pastor. Prove that it's not blessing some televangelist that is the sowing of the seed spoken of here. Look at verse 9 in the same context. Remember, this is the only passage in the New Testament where sowing a seed talks about giving money. Look at verse 9. This is a quote from the Old Testament. As it is written, the righteous one, the one who has sown bountifully, he has dispersed his seed abroad. He has given to the rich television ministry. He has given to the poor, it says. And because of this, his righteousness endures forever. Look at verse 12. We give, it returns to the administration of the service or the ministry. It not only supplies the needs of the saints, it helps the body of Christ, the work of Christ in the body. It helps believers who are in need, but it also is abounding through many thanksgivings to God. It brings glory to God, not glory to one particular ministry. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 9 says, Whoever has a bountiful eye, a good eye, a blessed eye, they will be blessed. Why? Because they share their bread with the poor, with the poor of this world. In Proverbs 19, verse 17, we are told, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord. Will some of the poor waste the money? Yes. Will some of the poor misuse the money? Yes. But it's as if you gave the money to God. And He will repay you for this deed. He will take care of you for this deed. When you sow to them, you sow in faith, knowing that God will handle it. Some of them will waste it, but some of it will be good seed that will be used in mighty ways. The person who wishes to make the most out of their money for future use and personal comfort will give liberally to God's work. The person who wishes to make the most out of their grain will not leave the seed in the granary, but instead will commit it to the earth, knowing that God will bring a harvest. John Calvin, as he preached on this passage, said these words. He said, This harvest that comes should be understood both in terms of a spiritual reward of eternal life and also the earthly blessings which God honors the generous giver. Not only in heaven does God reward the well-doing of the godly, but in this world as well. Materially, God provides for the giving heart. There is a wonderful promise in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 19. It says, My God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This means you don't have to beg for money. Let me tell you something. A real ministry does not have to beg for money. It doesn't have to constantly talk about money because it worships the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and can sell a few of them if He wants to to provide. Amen. A true ministry worships the living God who doesn't have to plead for money. Instead, trust by faith that God will provide. That verse is in the context of verses 4, verses 15 through 18 of Philippians. And in that context, Paul is saying, Philippians, you have generous hearts. And because of this, God will supply all your needs. As we give to God, He provides for us. Why wouldn't He? We're His children. He loves us. Spiritually, we can trust that God will reward the giving heart both now and in eternity. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus spoke these words. He said, Everyone who has left their house or their brother or their sister or their father or their mother or their wife or their children or their lands for my name's sake, anyone who has died to self, who has lost for the sake of the gospel, he will receive a hundredfold. He will inherit eternal life, meaning we never lose out when we give to God. The Lord will never be in debt to any man, and we should never be afraid of giving too much. Yes, the saying is true. Spiritually and materially, you cannot outgive God. What are the results of this? Number one, the results include comfort and peace, which result from giving. Jesus Christ himself, as is quoted in the book of Acts chapter 20, said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The blessing of God, heaven, 
being smiling on you, being poured out on you, the kingdom of God ruling and reigning in your heart, knowing there's a living God that loves you and is using you and will keep you and will take what you have committed and He will not lose it, but He will keep it until that day. Oh, what a blessing it is inside. You won't know what this means until you've really worshipped God by giving. Until you've really opened your hands and said, nothing in my hands I bring. I give it all to you simply to the cross I claim. Number two, the results include the reflection on what has happened later. This will produce more happiness in remembering what God has done when He used you to bless others. This is better than realizing your whole life you have hoarded up useless wealth. You have squandered what God has given you wastefully. No person has been created in this world to live for yourself. The two great means of every Christian life in this room today is the glory of God and the good of others. That's the only way the Christian life works properly. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus told a parable. He said, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. He harvested much. And this man thought within himself, and he said, What shall I do? since I have no room to store all my crops. So he said to his soul, I will do this. I will pull down my current barns and I will build greater barns. There I will store all my crops and all my goods. I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, you're a fool, he says. This day, your soul will be required of you. This night, your soul is required of you. Then, whose will those things be for which you have provided? So it is to the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. There will come a day where you will realize you are a fool for hoarding all these things God has given you. You will realize you are a fool for wasting all these things God has given you. There are no U-Hauls following hearses. Amen? Amen. You only have one life here, but there is a life to come, and you will realize how foolish you were when you see how wasteful you were. Number three, God will bring fruit from this. Proverbs 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Whoever captures or wins souls is wise. Lives will be changed. When you give to Corinth, Corinth, when you give to Jerusalem, lives will be changed. People will be saved. You will not meet them just in this life, but in the life to come. You might never meet them in this life, but you will meet them in the life to come. Some of the the brothers and the pastors that I cried with and prayed with this week, they told me those solemn words that if I do not see you here in Columbia again, I will see you in heaven. And I pray you will see many that these teachings have touched in the ministry that I go to. Oh, what words that stirred my heart. That when we do today, it is not for today, it is for the world to come. If this is your best life, you are in dire straits. There is a life to come, eternal life. In Psalms 126, verse 5, we are told, Those who sow in tears will reap with shouts of joy. Sometimes it will cost us much to give. But there will be much joy one day for the sacrificial giving. In fact, George Mueller said, God does not judge our giving by how much we give, but instead by how much we keep. Oh, what a profound thought that is. This includes God providing for us. Not a financial miracle, not taking you necessarily out of debt, though God wants you out of debt, and debt debt is a bad thing. I believe those principles. Not getting a new car, though that can be a blessing. And there's nothing wrong with that at times. Not having a new house. Though there's nothing sinful with having a new house if God has so enabled you. Not getting a new husband like I heard one televangelist preach. I mean the first one. What makes you think the second one's going to be any better, right? Instead, so you can give more to his kingdom helping others. I had the blessing the second day I was in Colombia to spend some time with a very financially blessed brother. And I made some house visits with him. 
He didn't have to get begged by the church leadership to go. It was very late at night. It had been a long day. We were very tired, and yet there was a sister in Christ in need. And so we drove there, and uh, he ministered to her. And I don't want to take any glory from God and from the work of God in this brother's life, but my friends, he was generous with his time. His whole family came and was generous, and I had the privilege to pray with this widow. And it so stirred up my heart because he was financially well-to-do. He took what he had to help others, and he had joy, not from things. He had joy because God was working, blessing, and using him. There is nothing greater in this world than to know that God is the potter, and he is forming us into clay, and we are his instruments being used in this world. Our lives are not boring anymore. They are exciting. These are exciting days we live in when the living God living through us. You say, prove that, Pastor. Look at chapter 9, verse 8. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, this is the, the harvest, what happens? You will abound in good work. It's not so that you get more and you store more up. It's so that you can give more. I always pray for our church to grow, not because I want more people here. It's because I want us to give more to others. I want the glory of God to be greater, His name to be more famous in Pensacola. Not Klondike's name. We can change that name tomorrow for all I care. I want Jesus' name to be great. That's what it's about. Look at chapter 9, verse 11. You will be enriched in every way. The modern prosperity theology will stop there. They'll say, you'll be enriched in every way if you sow your seed. But they forget why. It's to be generous in every way. To produce thanksgiving to God, not to a ministry that you sowed your seed to. It bothers me when people are constantly commending their churches and the ministries they gave money to and how much these ministries and churches have done for them. No, my friends, if it is really the work of God, it is God who gets all the glory, for He is the one working through His people. Oh, we are stripping God of His glory when we teach false views about giving. He says in these verses that God is able. Do not suppose that by you giving liberally you will be impoverished, that you will be reduced to what? God is able. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. He is able to do far more abundantly than all we could ask or think. He will make all grace, every kind of blessing abound in your life as you give in this way. Martin Luther said, I have tried to keep things in my hands. And I have lost them all. But what I have given into God's hands, I still possess. Martin Luther said the reason why he gave his fingers in our, on our hands is for the money to slip through to be a blessing to others. How will God abound this grace? He will do it materially. He will give promotions to us. Some of us will be blessed with better pay. Some of us will have unexpected gifts of money and God will provide when we feel like we have nothing because we gave our last dollar. Sometimes he will make things last longer so we don't suffer the cost of having to replace them over and over again. Spiritually, God may bless our giving by freeing our hearts from the tyranny of the American dream, the tyranny of competing with the Joneses, the tyranny of greed and materialism. He will give us true contentment and happiness as we store up riches in heaven where moths will not destroy, where rust will not corrupt, where thieves and the stock market cannot steal from us. There is no end to the blessings God will give as He makes grace to abound to us. We will have sufficiency in all things. The generous giver will have more than enough to meet his own needs and to do the good deeds to others. My friends, we are blessed so we can be a blessing to others. God wants us to be channels of blessing, not reservoirs of blessing. Many of us are building our little kingdoms instead of building the only kingdom that lasts. But we will see one day our kingdoms will fall. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord, Jesus Christ, and He will reign forever. Number four. In our next life, God will in some way repay in heaven far more than the gifts He has given on this earth. He will, I don't understand that. No eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor has entered into the thoughts of men the things God has prepared for those who love Him. But my friends, God will take care of His own one day. Galatians chapter 6 
It says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever one sows, that he will reap. One who sows to the flesh will in the flesh reap corruption. It'll decay. The moth will destroy it. It'll fall apart. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap from the Spirit eternal life. I think of the words of the missionary to Ecuador, Jim Elliott. Jim Elliott and a group of men with their wives went to the country of Ecuador to go to the Wayodani Indians, a fierce tribe, a tribe that had never heard the gospel of Jesus. They were the ones who found the tribe. They are the ones who first made contact with the tribe. And my friends, Jim Elliott and his friends gave their lives for the gospel. They were martyred. They were killed. They left children and wives behind for the sake of the gospel. They sowed a seed, the martyr seed. And this is what Jim Elliott said in his diary. These words are so profound. He said, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep on this earth to gain what he cannot lose in eternity. And by the way, the wives went back and other missionaries went. And today, there is a great church of the Wayodani Indians. Because of the sacrifice, there was a harvest, a great harvest that happened. We've seen principles drawn from nature. Look at verse 7. Principles drawn from God's nature as we finish up. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly or of necessity. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. We see the person of our giving. Let each one, each one of us, should be a giver. Some, we only have small resources, so we give from our small resources. We cannot give much, but what we have, we give. Some have great resources, and from that we should give greatly. It is about equal sacrifices, not equal gifts. You see, whether you have much to give, like Zacchaeus did, who was converted as a tax collector and was very wealthy, or whether you have one might, like the widow who gave at the temple in Jerusalem. Either way, we need to give generously from our hearts. That's the person who's supposed to give, every believer. What is the proportion? We give as we have purposed. Perfect tense. We give as we have purposed. Paul did not want to exhort extort anything out of the Corinthians. He did not want them to give against their will. He doesn't give a command. He doesn't give a rule. He doesn't give a regulation. He doesn't give a promise. He does not coerce them to give. He doesn't have to preach hour-long sermons begging for money and putting a guilt trip on people if they don't give. He doesn't have to run a commercial on TV and show sad pictures of children who are sick and dying in order to get them to give. He says here we should give as we have determined, premeditated, and purposed. It should be with thought and design. You don't have to have three sermons in each service in which uh, there is a sermon just for the offering, a sermon just for the music, and a sermon just for the message, trying to manipulate people, give by worshiping. It should all be one sermon of worship to God. The whole thing should be worship. Give as you have purpose, with thought and design. Some people only do good by accident. I'm glad when you do good by accident, but it's much better to do good on purpose. This teaches us that the heart is usually first touched before the head is. And we should follow our hearts as we give, the prompting of our heart. The mind and the will make much, may take much time to deliberate, but when the heart is led by the Holy Spirit, we should benevolently and liberally give. Again, this is not to be understood of the quantity. It's not to be understood of a set amount. Instead, it is the quality, it is the nature of our giving. So we've seen the person who gives. We've seen the proportion. We see the place. It's in the heart. We should give because we want to give, because God has put it in our hearts to give. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Of your own free will, of your own free choice, not directed or forced by anyone else, but according to what God has done inside you. But the sad thing is, there is a perversion in this verse. Many people give grudgingly, they give of necessity. The Jewish people in Jerusalem at the temple had two chests in the temple, two offering boxes where you could give. One was the box of necessity. 
It was the box where you gave what the law required. The other was the free will offering box, the box where you could give above what was required of you. Too many of us are lawgivers. We give just enough to get by. We are not grace givers being blessed by God. My friends, we are not called to be lawgivers. Jesus has completed the law. We are called to be grace givers. You see here, he says, don't give grudgingly. The Greek word means of grief, of sorrow, of sadness, as if we are upset to part with this money, as if we love this money more than the people it will serve, as if we love this money more than we love the God who we are supposed to be giving to. It's like it's a painful thing to give. Instead, you're always thinking, oh, what could I have done with that money? So I don't give it to the church. Give it to that poor guy. What I could have done, I could have got a new TV. I could have got a better pair of shoes. I could have got a better car. If I didn't have to keep giving to the work of God, that's grudgingly giving, giving of grief, of uneasiness of mind, reluctantly with complaining. My friends, we are naturally selfish. We are prone to distrust. We give sometimes because we think, well, God will be pleased with us. We'll escape judgment. If we give, we'll escape hell. We'll escape, escape God's anger. We just give because oh, we have to. The second idea is giving of necessity. Because a preacher says, today is the only day. If you plant your seed, you'll get a tenfold increase. God has told me this. If you don't give today, the church will close tomorrow. Maybe it's time for the church to close. I didn't realize the church was a building. Maybe it's not a real church if it's just about money. Nowhere in the New Testament does the Bible teach if there's no money, the church must close its doors. There's plenty of churches in the world that have no money, and they have great power because of the Holy Spirit. Of necessity means it's like going to the dentist because you have to have a tooth pulled. That's how a lot of you give sometimes. It's like you only do it, but man, does it hurt. And you only do it because it hurts, because you you think you won't hurt anymore if you get the tooth pulled. This is legalism. I obey... Because I have no choice. God won't love me. God won't answer my prayers. I'll never get out of debt. I'll never have the new car unless I give. This is what religion teaches. Tim Keller has said it this way. Religion says, I obey, therefore God accepts me. Many of us today hear this on TV. You obey, God accepts you. But the gospel says, I'm accepted because of what Jesus has done, so I obey. That's the right way to give. We obey God, yes, because it's necessary, but we should do it because He loves us. And we, in turn, love Him, not because we want to be accepted by Him. Jesus has already done that for us. We see the principle lastly in this verse. The reason why is because God loves a cheerful giver. The Greek word cheerful is the Greek word hilaros. Hilaros, where we get the word hilarious from. Used only here in the New Testament. It's the root word for our English word, hilarious. God wants us to give happily because that's how God gives. Happily, generously, with joy. God loves a joy-motivated giver because it expresses God's gracious joy as He gives to us. Let me ask you, who doesn't love a cheerful giver? Valuable as any gift is, if it's forced, who really wants it? How many of you have said so, and at least in your heart... That's the way they're going to give it. They can keep it. I don't want what they have, right? Because they gave it begrudgingly with a closed fist. They didn't give it because they love you or care about you. They had no choice. It's like the loser in the race who has to turn the trophy over to the winner. He's angry about it. He doesn't think the other person deserves it. It's like the man who is encountered by someone who is homeless or poor asking for help. And you don't give because your heart is broken for this person, because all of a sudden God has put a supernatural love for you in this person. You give to get the person away from you because they stink, because they look bad, because they don't have good grammar. And so you try to push them away as quickly as possible. I have seen homeless people give money back at times, my friends. I have, because of the hard attitude. How would God feel when we give in this way? God loves a heart that is like His heart. Let me ask you, can we lose out by doing that which God is pleased? I don't think so. Sow your seed, you will be blessed. But not in the ways the modern church often teaches. You will be blessed by God. You will have something better than life itself. If you don't believe me, think about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. They believed in the prosperity theology. They gave a lot, thinking they'd done their job, and God would be happy with them because they gave so much. 
That was the first major instance of church discipline in the Bible. And oh, how severe it was, the judgment that came upon them. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, Give, and it will be given to you. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. The purpose in the Corinthian giving was not to get from God. It was to spread eternal seed of God. Monetary seed is temporary. It is fading. It is weak. Money's here today and it's gone tomorrow. Spiritual seed is eternal. It is powerful. It is mighty to save. It brings lasting joy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 23 to 25, Peter explains why we sow material seeds. He says we are born again, not of corruptible seed, not of perishable seed, not of seed that's temporary and fading and weak, it's not you get God's grace because you give money. We are born again instead through the living and abiding word of God. All of our flesh, all the things of this world are like grass. The grass withers. The flowers, they fall away. But the word of our Lord endures forever. And this word is the good news that is preached unto you. Our giving of seed must lead to the true gospel or it is not true seed. Our giving must lead to helping the poor so that they will not necessarily, they might still be poor in this world, but they will not be poor in faith. Our giving should be so lives will be changed forever by the gospel, not so your life will be changed, but so that God's name will be great in others' lives. You see, it is about what Jesus has given. Jesus did not give out of guilt. Jesus did not give grudgingly. He did, was not forced to give. He gave of his own will. He laid down his life for us. Why? Because he loves us. While we were sinners, God demonstrated his love. And so we should give. We should sow our seed. But it's not because of how great we are, because of what we're going to get from God. It's because God loves us. And we want to see his love go to others. We want to see his name to be great. So if you don't know the love of Christ today, we don't need your money here. We don't want your money. But God does love you, and God does want your heart. He wants to change you forever. If you're a believer, He doesn't want you to give to get approval from Him, to get blessing from Him. That's manipulation. When you give, you're reflecting His heart. You're becoming closer because you're becoming more like Him. Would you join me in prayer, please? Our Father, I thank You for Your grace and Your salvation this morning. I thank You for Your goodness to us. Oh, I pray for good seed, the seed of the Word of God to increase in this church, the seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ to abound in our lives. Lord, you are a generous king. You give far more than we could ever ask or think. You are a good Savior and Lord. I pray today for any that are lost that don't know Jesus as Lord of their life, that today, right now in their hearts, they would call out to you as the generous one and be saved, be forgiven. Realize church isn't just about getting money or about buildings or things. It's about the gift of salvation. And today, the Holy Spirit would open their hearts right now and they would be saved. For believers, that we would be generous in our giving, not just in an offering plate, but with our whole lives. Not so we would get from you, but so we would see your blessings abound in our lives and in this world. We love you, Lord. You are the generous King. And so I pray now that you would be generous as we worship you you would work in our hearts and we'll give you praise in Jesus name and God's people said amen friend this is Joshua Walnofer pastor of Klondike Baptist and I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today if we can be of any help to you answer any questions about the Bible, or talk more with you about the salvation provided by the mighty hand of Christ Jesus, feel free to contact us by any of the methods mentioned on our church website. If you would like to share a testimony of how God's Word has transformed your life, please write and let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand.